Recording. Thank you. Seeing the presence of a quorum, I'm gonna call this meeting of GOL to order. It is 10.32 on November 3rd. Um, we are being recorded. Um, pursuant to chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. Just gonna make sure that everyone can be heard and uh, seen. And so we start with Mandy. Present. And Pat? Yes. And Darcy? Yes. Okay. And our panelists, I no longer see them. I don't know why they disappeared from my screen. Um, They're so still here, they just took cameras off. Okay. Thank you. So Matt, if we can hear you, if you just say hello. Hello, good and morning. Thank you. And Mahek, if you could just say hello. Hi, good morning. Great, thank you. So everyone can be seen and heard. Um, the agenda this, this morning is, is fairly straightforward. We're gonna begin with the, uh, the, the, the finance committee interviews and I'll describe that process in just a second. And we have our two uh, interviewees present. So um, we're gonna begin with that. Um, there is a proclamation that we we're going to review, but I've not heard from the sponsor, so I'm going to just hold off on that. And then we have some business, uh, internal business related to GOL. So I'm hoping that this will not, well, I'll, of course, we also deliberate after the interview. So sorry, I skipped that step. Um, so I hope this will not be a two-hour meeting, but we will see. Um, so we're going to start with the FinCom interviews. As I said, the two candidates are present. Uh, they've been sent the interview questions, and what we're going to do is proceed through them in order, one through six, um, and we will alternate the order of who begins first. Um, that'll be my responsibility to keep track of that. Um, as it said in the uh, message we sent you, you'll have up to three minutes. Um, I will be keeping my eye on the clock and uh, to answer each question. You don't need to use all three minutes, but you have up to three. Um, a member of the committee will ask a question. Um, there are no follow-up questions, and um, the order of answering, as I said, will be random. And so that's, let's uh, first of all introduce our two candidates. We have- Can we, um, George? Yes, sorry. Can you, I apologize. Go ahead. Could you put the interview questions up? I did not print a copy, okay. and I'm all having right. trouble so, getting on SharePoint. All right, hang on for a second. So I will do that. Share screen. And uh, okay, oh, I gotta do something else first, sorry. Okay, interview questions, there we go. All right. Apologies. It's all right. Um, all right, I'm gonna stop sharing. Can you all see that? Yes. GOL interview questions, okay, good. Um, and I'll have them right up there, good. You are sharing your whole screen, George. Ah, so you know. sorry, okay, I didn't wanna do that. Instead of so, just the interview questions. Right, so let me stop that for a second, thank you. Let me start over, make sure that's- Sorry, there. folks. It's all right, it's okay. Um, no problem. Share screen and interview questions, where did they go? There they are, okay, thank you. So now you should just see the interview questions, I hope. All right. And um, so any questions from the folks being interviewed about the process? All right, then we're going to um, begin and we're gonna begin with Mahek and um, Mandy, if you'd ask the first question. Sure. So what do you feel you bring to the finance committee that can make it successful? Thank you so much for your question. Um, I think that I, I'm pretty young, as we can all see, and I, uh, although I do not have a lot of professional experience in the field of finance, I choose to do so in the future. I study finance and resource economics at UMass right now. Um, the experience that I bring into the finance committee, I bring in from a smaller scale. I've worked at uh, three different nonprofit organizations, and I've helped them in their financials in a certain way. Uh, another way in which I can bring in my experiences by um, my experience as a treasurer for the UMass 
college Democrats. I do have some experience in um, making the budget for the this current financial year for my group. But apart from that, I also have some training and ed education, which is ongoing. Um, I also bring in a fresh perspective, I believe. I come in from India. I've lived there for the first 18 years of my life. So I do have sort of an international point of view about um, money and finance. But yeah, that's my answer. <laughs> OK, thank you very much. Uh, Matt. Yeah, good morning and thanks for the uh, opportunity to interview. I think that I bring, um, I have some experiences that, that, are, that are relevant and I think I also bring uh, temperament and, and a set of uh, values and, and responsibility that would serve the committee well. Um, I served on a number of different sort of deliberative uh, committees, you know, professionally and also in town. Um, including the cultural council, I'm the co-chair of that, and and um, and then professionally, you know, I, I've worked um, in state and municipal governance governance for for uh, I don't know 10, 15 years now. Um, I'm the special education director currently in a regional school district, so I'm very involved in the budget making process, and and you know, on the on the back end of being a department head, um, you know, know the process of working with stakeholders. Uh, you know, building administrators, parents, um, members of the community at large, and then, you know, bringing those forward to the public body for, for their review and approval. Um, I've done so in, in a municipal district as well in Greenfield. And then prior to that, you know, I have experience at the state level, um, sort of, again, with a slightly different perspective, but, but um, as the uh, authorizer of a number of large state and federal grants. Um, so I, I feel pretty comfortable around budgets um, and I think more importantly around the budgeting process. Uh, and so I think, you know, as a, as a finance committee member, I would bring uh, a, lot of, a lot of value to the committee. Great, Matt, thank you. Now, Pat, if you could ask the second question. Uh, what is your understanding of the role of the finance committee? And uh, Matt, if you would start this time. Sure, thanks. Thanks for the question. Uh, the role of the Finance Committee, I think it's it's interesting and, and an exciting one to me because of the the relationship between finance and the town council as a whole. Um, you know, I, I really think of this as a as a highly trusted um, thought partner to the larger council. You know, I understand that finance makes recommendations to the council that are not necessarily binding, but that carry a great deal of weight um, due to the relationships uh, and, and the composition of the bodies that, that are making those recommendations. Um, I also know when complex issues come before the council uh, or when information does not seem to be fully out there for the council, the council doesn't have full information, that they can often send particular items to finance for deeper study and investigation. and. I really appreciate that um, that role, and I also understand that it's a public body, and you know, follow is governed by the laws of, of open meeting law and, and other um, laws, and and you know the importance of of that as a formal structure. Um, so I, I do see it as an advisory committee to the town council, but one that has a great deal of, of import, and you know, kind of looking ahead to the next question, um, the importance that it that it has by having non voting resident members on the on the finance committee, um, I think gives the council a needed perspective on, on, on questions of, of finance. Great, thank you. Thank you, Matt. Um, Mahek. Um, do I answer the same question? Yes, you do, please. Okay, perfect. Um, <laughs> yeah, so exactly. So while the finance committee is uh, an advisory committee, I, I do have experience working with another advisory board. I actually worked with, worked with the districting advisory board. It, uh, our work just got over and uh, happy to say that the map got approved as well. Um, it is an advisory committee, but like um, you, we all say, financial planning is extremely important. I think it's the backbone of creating a developing process. Um, so uh, the fact, the, I'm sorry, I kind of forgot the question. Well, what we're what asking, is, the, sorry, go ahead. 
pad, sorry. Uh, what is your understanding of the role of the understanding? I, I'm so sorry. Yes. That's, all right. That's okay. <laughs> So the role of the financial committee is obviously budgeting and it will get busier during the budgeting season around uh, April and May. But apart from that, just approving of the various different expenses that the town of Amherst makes um, and creating um, sort of plans and advices regarding the same. Um, I think the finance committee is something that's really important because money does tend to be a big constraint when it comes to um, the execution of different plans and creating good financial structure is just really important for any body of government and it would just be my privilege to try and contribute to this process in any way possible. Good, thank you. Uh, Darcy, if you do the next one, please. Yeah. Um, what is your understanding of your role as a non-voting member? And Mahek, if you would begin this time. Absolutely. So I, um, my understanding of my role as a non-voting member is that uh, I have to be present in the meetings in order to maintain quorum. And uh, I definitely learned this, like I said, working with the Districting Advisory Board. Uh, it is extremely systematic and I understand that I, it, it is a big responsibility to be present in order for um, things to happen. Um, again, like I mentioned before, it is advisory. So whatever the Finance Committee decides may not be uh, completely binding. And um, yeah, that's all I have to say. Okay. Uh, Matt? So as a non-voting member, um, I believe, you know, I've, I've heard in the past and I, and I hold it to be true that the finance committee looks to the, not, um, in terms of, of the deliberation itself, that the voting members of the committee look to the non-voting members as, as equal partners in the discussion which I really um, appreciate and, and find that to be a, you know, a, a great honor. And, you know, I think the, the vote itself, um, as I said, you know, the recommendations that finance makes to the town council, I think are uh, non-binding, but, but taken in with great seriousness. Um, so the vote itself, it has great import. And um, my impression from talking to counselors who are, who are members of finance is that the, um, the opinions and deliberation of the non-voting resident members are taken, taken, um, you know, with with an equal degree of, of import and seriousness. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, it goes back to my earlier answer that having non-voting residents um, on the finance committee gives it an additional piece of credibility for the council. So the council knows that not only have you know elected councilors debated and, and come to these recommendations, but they've also heard the voices of of you know taxpayers and residents. And and I think that. That's um, incredibly important, you know, and I'm not sure if, if uh, to, to um, the previous point, I'm, I'm not sure if the presence of a non-voting member would affect the quorum or not. That's, we do it slightly differently with the Cultural Council. Um, but I, you know, my, my thought is that it's much more about the deliberation and discussion uh, and, the, and the variety of perspectives that the non-residence members bring as it is um, to the voting procedures. Okay, thank you. Now, Mandy, if you take the next one. Um, tell us about an experience you have had collaborating with a group, particularly when opinions were in conflict or a decision was controversial. And Matt, I'm gonna ask you to start this time. Right, it is funny to you answer and then you, and then you you answer first the second time so it's, it's a little bit of a, a brain a brain shift yes it is um, it's part of the test here <laughs> i like it I, cognitive flexibility right um so i i think the example i wanted to bring up was uh in relation to the cultural council and um specifically you know we we have a, a window of of six weeks or so where we're very very busy um reviewing grant applications and issuing grants and last year um we came to a point in that process where some of us were very passionate about um, funding additional accessibility services, sign language interpreting, um, you know, services for the visually impaired, mobility impaired, et, et cetera. 
And that was a huge chunk of work that was not on our official slate. And um, so there was a little bit of, I think, uh, I wouldn't say this dispute at all, but just in terms of time management, it was just unrealistic to do that um, within the confines of our, of our normal amount of time. And, you know, we, we spun off uh, a subcommittee on accessibility from the, from the main cultural council. And that was actually one of three subcommittees that we um, formed and then disbanded as a cultural council. And each time we had different members joining those subcommittees with different passion areas. Um, and, and I think we did a really good job of, of being action focused in the subcommittees and bringing recommendations to the larger council of how to move forward, you know, in, in the example I'm giving specifically with accessibility. So we, we found administrative funds, we created a, a side fund and we were able to support that work in a non-biased and, and um, you know, compliant way. Mm -hmm. uh, we were able to run everything through the approvals of the formal council, but also, you know, let the people who had the um, expertise and passion and interest in, in that area um, do the work that they wanted to do. And it was, you know, it, it maybe it's not the biggest dispute that I've been a part of. I work in special education, so my life is kind of full of, you know, two sides not necessarily seeing, seeing uh, equal. But it, but I think it was a good example for for this interview because um, because of the sort of committee, subcommittee, sub subcommittee, <laughs> that interrelationship. I I believe in that, you know, because I believe that that a lot of what we call disputes are really just uh, a failure to fully understand the perspectives of each party that's that's involved in a conversation and I think that you know in in government and especially municipal government um, subcommittees and other sort of procedural uh, pieces like that can really allow for for the fullness of perspectives to be heard okay thank you Mahik if you could answer Right, so I would have usually given the example of my work at the DAV, but I think that I have another example that's really personal to me. So uh, two years ago, um, right when I was graduating high school, I was the president of our student government. Uh, a really pressing issue that was concerning me the whole time was the lack of mental health resources that we had. And as we all know, public schools are severely underfunded. So that just the concept of bringing up uh, all of this money to be spent on mental health resources and the results of which are not quantifiable was something that was completely utopian to my school and everyone else um, whom I had to report to. So there was this ongoing conflict because it was so clear that there were so many students who needed these resources, but at the same time, the administration was unable to provide that for us. So this was one of the biggest situations where I had to realize the power of resilience as well as the power of patience at the same time. Um, we come up with many situ situations like these in the process of resource allocation, and we can easily draw parallels with finance as well, because finance is all about resource allocation. Um, and sometimes um, there are completely polarizing opinions about these issues. And in the end, I'm happy to say that I was able to do it by a lot of convincing, a lot of information sessions, a lot of uh, bringing a lot of third party members in and trying to have open conversation about how uh, we need to destigmatize mental health. And ever since I left, we do have a certain amount of money allocated towards mental health resources in my school. And I'm really happy about that. But um, yeah, I think this, this particular instance was just really pressing to me. And um, like I mentioned before, just really personal about how uh, decision making happens in such issues. Great, Mark. thank you. Um, Pat, if you do number five. Yes. <clears throat> what else would you like us to know about you that makes you a strong candidate for the Finance Committee? And Mahak, if you would begin, please. Absolutely. Thank you for your question. Um, I think that my strongest uh, trait would be my passion for learning. So like I mentioned before, I do not have um, a lot of relevant experience because I'm, I'm still in college. I'm still a junior. But uh, this is something that I know that I want to do for a long, long time. I do want to work in the government sector and I do want to work in the finance field. Um, something else that about me that um, 
makes me a good candidate, I would say, is um, simply a, a fresh perspective, an international perspective. I have lived all over the place, not just two countries. I've, I've kept moving as I grew up. And uh, one of my main areas of interest and area in which I will be collaborating with a prof professor for research is development economics and international finance. Um, I think that these different perspectives would make me um, a, a good candidate to have for the finance committee. Good, thank you. Uh, Matt, if you could uh, answer. Sure. Uh, so thanks again. Um, I guess I, I would just say that, you know, as uh, as first time homeowners and parents of a of a two year old son, uh, I think my my spouse and I, you know, I think we represent um, an important voice in in the near future of Amherst's finances right now. Um, we are super excited about the large capital projects that are that are in play. Um, and, and I've followed closely all of the town manager's presentations on uh, the fiscal strategy that we're, we're currently planning to use to pay for these things. Um, so, so I think, you know, we're very much uh, <laughs> leaders for the, for the work. Um, and also we're gonna be major beneficiaries of it in terms of, you know, using a new library, using a new elementary school. I mean, you know, having public works, fire. I mean, all these things are, are really important to us on a day-to-day -day level, and and so um, we're very very excited about all of those things, and 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 I have a lot of faith in in the council and in the town manager and in the business office um, to make these things happen. But I also, you know, as a first-time homeowner, am and also very interested in seeing how this strategy plays out um, on a day-to-day -day level. And I think that honestly, where where the town is right now. We do need an extreme attention to detail in the, you know, in the ongoing, not just the capital budget, um, although the capital budget is requires a lot of attention right now, but the operations budget as well, because you know we're in good fiscal shape because um, because our operations I think have been well managed from what from what I gather and what I've heard, you know, have been well managed year over year um, to the point where we can make these really huge capital commitments in the next couple of years, but. But you know, as a as a homeowner, as a new homeowner, and uh, first time homeowner and, and taxpayer, you know, I, I really do want, want to be um, aware of and knowledgeable of of the uh, the financial tactics, shall we say, that, that are going to go behind this strategy. Um, and and I think that you know my my pers perspective and background in uh, municipal budgeting would be helpful in the deliberations that the finance committee makes. Great, Matt. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm going to do number six, if that's all right, um, just for the sake of uh, time. Currently, the Finance Committee meets twice a month during the year, but when budget season begins in April and May, meetings become much more frequent. And we would just like you to confirm that you have the time uh, to commit to this meeting schedule. And really, it's just a yes or no answer. So we just would like you each to acknowledge the time commitment and to confirm that you're able to, to meet that. Um, and so, uh, Matt? Yes. And Mahak? Yes, 100%. Okay, thank you. All right, that completes the, uh, the interview portion of this uh, uh, session. And uh, so in a moment, I'm going to ask, I believe Athena, if she's present, um, I think I can do it too, but I'm, I'm not sure what will happen. Let me stop sharing the screen for a second. Um, I might be able to do this myself, but I'm going to um, remove you both and put you into the audience. Um, let's just have a quick look here. Um, let's see if that's possible for me. No, I can't. I don't have that power. So Athena's doing it now. Okay, but before Athena, if you just hold for a second, again, on behalf of the committee, I'd like to thank you both uh, for making the time to come here this morning during our regular meeting session. And we're very grateful for your going through this process. And uh, in a few minutes, we're going to begin our deliberations. And uh, you're certainly welcome to stay in the audience and, and watch us at work. Um, but again, we just want to thank you both very much for, for taking the time to do this. So, Same. Thank you all. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time. You're welcome.
So I'm going to take a moment. And, Hang on. There uh, we go. I need to find um, something that. Okay. Hang on for a second. Um, I take a moment. Um, what I want to put on the screen and I did not put in my packet this morning for other reasons is the copy of our selection guidance. Um, and I'm looking for my copy of it. I've actually have so many versions of it that I want to make sure I put the right one up there. <laughs> That's the first problem. Um, so bear with me for a second. Yeah. All right, we'll do it this way. Okay, hang on for a second. Sorry. George, I have a basic question about our process. Okay, go ahead. Um, I may have missed something, but um, how did it end up that we had just two interviewees? I realized that they were the ones that filled out an SOI, but what didn't, we voted on the sufficiency of the pool based on the number of CAFs we got, right? That's correct. Um, and that was like six or seven? Uh, actually it was eight. We had eight, eight. Um, uh, candidates so, in the pool and they were all contacted. And uh, so we had eight members and uh, they were all sent uh, the notices and uh, invited to submit SOIs and only two submitted SOIs. One withdrew and the others did not respond and two submitted SOIs. So that, that kind of feels a little bit like the SOI process is a barrier. Um, no, it doesn't. Well, let's let Darcy finish. To me, I'm Go saying ahead. to me, yeah. it feels like that. Um, and why do you so feel it's a barrier? That there were only two people. I mean, I felt today like the pool wasn't sufficient, but we had already voted on it when there were eight. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it almost feels like we should be voting on sufficiency of the pool after we find out how many SOIs we have. Um, just saying mm -hmm. it, didn't, it didn't feel sufficient today to mm -hmm. me. Okay. Other thoughts from the committee on that? I, I think, think we have uh, two, two viable candidates to consider. Um, and I think that we can't, we can't control how people follow through. And I think the pool is sufficient today. I have up on the screen the selection guidance. Can you everyone see that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and um, the first part of it that we adopted is essentially what uh, is a general statement of what we look for um, when filling a, a vacancy in a multiple member body. Um, the second portion um, is specific to um, the finance committee. And so I'm going to keep that sort of highlighted on the screen, but I can scroll if we need to move it around. But just to remind us that selection of resident members shall be based on relevant experience, skills, and policy knowledge with an emphasis on municipal and public finance. And then it lists a series of qualifications. Um, and we also mentioned the idea of knowledge of and beyond Amherst. Um, and of course, in doing this, we solicited, we followed the procedure to solicit input from um, 
others. So um, with this guidance in front of us, I'd like to um, open the discussion. Um, Pat, I think you made a good point last time that it might make sense, first of all, to begin with each candidate and just uh, general comments about each one and avoid any kind of, uh, uh, you know, saying I prefer, or I, you know, but right now just sort of with the selection guidance in mind, um, just review each of the two candidates in general. And then once we've done that, um, move to a deliberation about uh, what we think, who we think might be a candidate that we would prefer. So if people are comfortable with that, I think that was a good suggestion last time um, that we start just with each individual and have a moment or two for each of us to talk about them. And then after that's done, we can uh, begin to turn to where we might um, have a preference. Is that acceptable? All right, so um, I'd like to begin with Mahek, if we could, and um, people's reactions, thoughts, uh, with the selection guidance in mind, but just basically any um, input just in reaction to what you've just heard. Mandy? Yeah, well, um, I'm always excited uh, to see young people, especially those involved in, you know, those that are institutions of higher learning trying to get involved in town um, affairs. It's something we work on a lot. And, you know, I'm, and so I'm excited for her candidacy um, that she's put herself out here to do this. She's, you know, when you look at the um, relevant experience and all, um, you know, she clearly has interest in municipal finance and is training in finance, right? That's that's her major. That's what she's going through in, in university right now. Um, you know, she, she lacks the experience serving on a public finance or audit committee, but many of the candidates we see lack that experience um, because that's quite specific. So, you know, I, I think she meets um, our selection guidance in terms of um, the experience portion of the guidance and also the, the members who reflect diversity of our town's residents portion of our selection guidance too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Other thoughts on Mahek and her candidacy on what uh, her answers to the questions or on anything either in her SOI um, or in her CAF? Darcy? I would just um, echo what Mandy Jo just said. Um, I would agree with all of that. Okay. Yeah, ditto. I, I just want to say one other thing. Mm -hmm. I, I really liked her answer to the collaboration question, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, experience mm -hmm. on a committee um, mm -hmm. that, that just, you know, showed some good experience even though she's quite young on working with policies that contradict each other, working through bringing people in and finding a solution that, that is amenable to all different constituencies. I thought that was a, a good um, experience to tell us, to, to give us some idea of her experience. Okay. Other thoughts, comments? from either of the, of the two of you. Um, I was struck by her experience on the DAB, um, fairly recent. Um, so she has some appreciation of uh, how the town works and the processes that uh, we need to follow, um, open meeting law, that sort of thing. Um, international perspective. Interesting. Um, I think the um, the lack of, of, of real life experience is, is, is going to be in terms of finance uh, is going to be a concern, but that uh, is also balanced by her obvious major, by her major and her, her passion for this. Um, any other thoughts before we switch to Matt? All right, let's, uh, for a moment, just immediate reactions to Matt's interview. 
Um, we probably should acknowledge something that we all know and uh, the public may not be aware of is this is the second time that uh, Matt has appeared before this body. So um, um, we have had the chance to interview him once before. And uh, so thoughts on Matt and on his uh, responses to our questions. He has a, a great deal of relevant experience. Um, he's uh, clearly grounded in this community now. Um, and as a first time home buyer uh, is gonna be impacted directly about, um, by decisions that are made in finance and the um, council. Um, I'm particularly interested in um, what he had to say about uh, subcommittee work. Mm -hmm. uh, it felt like it showed a kind of flexibility of thinking and uh, problem solving. He, like Mahek, he brings a passion to his work and to learning. I also, because I had uh, a chance to interview him last time, I had brought up a social justice question. And um, he, at that time, he felt like he hadn't answered it well. And it was interesting to me that in his SOI, he really uh, clarified and let us know uh, what his commitment is to social justice work. Um, and I found that, um, that, his, that his reflecting on um, previous encounters with this committee um, really affected how he was, what he thought about and what he responded to this time around. Okay. Other thoughts? Darcy, please. Uh, this is just a question. Um, sure. Do the, the existing non, um, non-voting resident members are Bernie Kubiak and Bob Hegner? Hegner, yes. Yes. Um, so I guess I personally take that into consideration when looking at this pool because of our interest in having diversity on our town boards and committees. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, well, right now we're, you know, we're looking at just thoughts about the candidate. Um, right. Well, I'm just saying Bernie okay. and Bob right. offer a lot of, um, you know, extensive, extensive budget experience mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and background in multiple different institutions. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I guess I, I'm just thinking you know, mm -hmm. as a whole, it would be nice for us to think about diversity. Mm -hmm. So I, I would agree with Pat on um, Matt's experience and all, um, you know, when we look at the selection criteria in terms of the relevant experience, he's got it. He's got, um, you know, again, maybe lacking the experience serving on public finance or audit committees um, from the volunteer point of view, but he certainly had to present <coughs> to some given his previous jobs. Um, so he might not have served on one, um, but there, and then he's got the training and expertise and the experience in municipal finance, uh, particularly on the school side. And, you know, so in that sense, he meets the criteria too. Um, mm -hmm. and all. Mm -hmm. I think that um, for myself, the one thing that immediately stood out, it's already been mentioned, is the fact that of his ties to the community and especially as a newer member and younger member of our community with a small child, um, the sense of uh, that connection and, and, and the issues that are going to be impacting the community for many years to come, um, that certainly resonated with me um, that's something I think that, that we don't have um, on the finance committee is that sense of, of the next generation and, and the young families who 
um, are you know a key part of, of our of Amherst and a key part of its future. So that having that voice and that perspective was something that that struck me and, and also in his response. I think also his experience in the field of education and schools and school budgets um, is something that I think is also that struck me as important. Um, given uh, that role that it, that it plays in our budgets. Um, and uh, so that was something that also stood out to me. Um, uh, I was impressed by his uh, clear understanding of how the, the finance committee works and uh, the role of a non-voting member and uh, this, the, uh, the sense that he has actually done some research and, and done some uh, you know further exploration um, about the committee and how non-voting members have been treated and how they are viewed by the committee and that also uh, impressed me um, just looking through my notes anyone else with any thoughts about matt's candidacy in general before we go to uh, sort of thinking about our preferences um, Okay, um, so we have two candidates in front of us. Um, they have certain strengths and certain uh, areas where, you know, they maybe would not completely cover everything that we're looking for, but I don't think any candidate could ever do that. Um, do people want to go to sort of just the initial sense of where they're leaning? Do they want to uh, make a case for a particular candidate? Um, uh, I'm all ears. Well, I'm clearly um, interested in Matt Holloway's participating on the committee as a member of finance. I think he will bring an additional perspective to the other two uh, that will deepen the contributions of the other two uh, non-resident member, uh, resident non-voting members. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm. You know, so I and I, I feel like what Ma Heck brings passion and, and she's young. I'm concerned about her ability to um, maintain a meeting schedule because at this point, as a, a student, she does not know what her spring semester will be. And that's a particularly difficult time for the finance committee. So I'm concerned about that. Um, and I, and I feel like as a member of the finance committee, it, it will be more helpful to, to rest on, the, on Matt's experience uh, and that I really would encourage Mahek to attend and participate as a, an attendee in finance committee meetings, because I think she has all the potential to become a member of the finance committee, but I, I feel like uh, I, I don't see yet the directness, the uh, focus uh, that I I think the finance committee needs. Needs. Okay. So I guess I'll, I'll say I don't know which way I'm leaning. Um, I agree with everything 
Pat said about Matt um, and our lack of family diversity on our many of our council committees yeah, at this point. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, yeah. that um, the group of people beyond students um, in terms of that are not well represented are those with kids. And so I agree with, with Pat that that is something that we needed to strive to do better with. Um, in a, and yet Mahek is showing a passion um, and an interest at such a young age that I have to absolutely respect. Um, it's something I'm not sure I could have done myself um, at, at that age um, and, you know, and brings her own type of diversity to the, would bring her own type of diversity to the finance committee. And so I guess every time we've done finance committee interviews, finance committee appointments um, for the last, what, two years, I think we've been doing yep. this. Yep. It, we're, we're always faced with a tough choice. Um, because we have such a um, plethora of, of good people and qualified candidates that come and want to contribute to the town. Um, and so it comes down to what, at what, at what I am weighing more at whatever time I'm doing these interviews in terms of what's most important. So I'm not sure where I am on that yet. Um, because I think on the relevant experience, I, I would give a little bit of weight to Matt um, having better relevant experience, skills, and policy knowledge, but I don't think either are not qualified on that ground. Um, but but then we have to look at the first part of the selection guidance, which is um, a good group of members that have experience, a good crop of members that are new, um, and and those that reflect the diversity of the town. So I'm, I guess I'm, I'm saying I'm not sure where I am right now. You know, what I'm struggling with, um, and please someone, if they wanna speak up, I, I try to wait until, um, but we're getting long gaps of silence here. So, uh, I mean, we do have two hours, so we do have time, but um, what I'm struggling with is, is appointing a student to this body. Um, it's really a struggle for me. Um, and that comes from someone who, was super excited with the DAB to have students uh, serve. Um, and as I think all of you know, that was, that was a difficult uh, process. Uh, not the, the DAB struggled to meet quorum, it struggled to, and that was over a very focused period of time. And uh, the issue was not just with the student members, but that was part of the challenge. Um, and here's a body that will be meeting for uh, two years. And um, we do give a preference to, um, it's not decisive, but we give a preference to uh, people who are uh, serving more than two years because of the experience factor. Um, and uh, this is an undergraduate who is a junior. And as Pat pointed out, um, as an undergraduate, they don't even know what their schedule will be like in the spring. And they have no idea whether they will still be, it's unlikely, not impossible, but unlikely they'd be in Amherst um, after their senior year. Um, and I would think it would be unusual for someone to stay in Amherst, uh, make a decision like that, just based on their service on a town committee, especially a non-voting town committee, but I think any town committee. So I'm really struggling just from the whole idea of, of appointing a student to a body like this. Um, we don't have many bodies that we appoint people to. These are extremely important bodies. Um, and um, maybe this is just going to be a problem that a future GOL and a future council will have to wrestle with. Um, but um, I, given the experience with the DAB, um, given my understanding of the challenges that students face, um, you know, just academically and socially and all the rest, um, and given this, the importance of this body, um, that's something I'm really struggling with to make that kind of commitment. Um, and so uh, we do ask that question. It's a yes or no answer. Um, we may talk at some other date about our format and about our questions. I mean, that's part of the process that we go through as a body. But um, so that's something I'm really struggling with um, uh, apart from everything else. When I look at Matt, um, the social justice answer in the SOI, 
the fact that he has a young family, um, uh, his experience with school budgets, um, his knowledge of, of, the, of the FinCom and how it works, his knowledge of the four capital projects, um, that these are all ticks in my box. Um, and I'm weighing that against a young woman who's clearly passionate and has a very strong interest in finance and is studying it. But I think given the importance of this body and given the commitment that we're asking, um, I, I'm really struggling with the idea of appointing to a student um, where we just don't know and they don't know and they can't say whether they will be here in two years time um, or for that matter, even in the spring, what their schedule will be. And again, um, the experience of the DAB to me was very, very disappointing. Um, it was made very clear to all the candidates that this was a very compressed process and made very clear that the time commitment and yet it struggled, as you all know, mightily to make quorum. And we had to go back and it was, it was not, not a pleasant process. So um, that's also weighing on me, that experience. Other thoughts? Well, and I'm prepared to make a motion, um, if uh, no one else is, that I would recommend to the uh, town council that, uh, that or at least this committee recommends to the town council that uh, uh, Matt Holloway um, be um, chosen to, uh, how do I want to put this? Um, my mind is on other things actually today. But uh, someone want to phrase this in a way that it is would coherent. be recommend the council appoint Point, Matt yes, Holloway to the finance committee as a non-voting resident member for a term Here. Right. to you. begin immediately and end. Do we know whether it's 2022 or 2023? It'd be 2023. Um, okay, June, June 30, 2023. So thank you, Mandy. That's the motion I'd like to make. Is there a second? Second, DeAngelis. So we have a motion that's been made and seconded. Darcy? I just wanted to, I probably should have commented before. I just um, am going to abstain because I do, I kind of, I feel like the, we don't have an adequate pool and that will be the reason why I abstain. And I especially think we need to work out, you know, like if we're not, if we're not going to have students on our committees and boards that yeah. we should let them know in advance that you know not including students um because if that's a reason for uh rejecting them well so yeah I hear you. we would yeah. have a really small pool we'd have one person <laughs> um and so we, we just need to you know put people on notice if we're if we're not going to look at students and i'm not saying one way or the other we just need to if we're not if we're going to say we don't want students then we should let people know in advance well i'm just speaking for myself so um and i'm not saying i don't want students but um i tried to explain that a recent experience that you're all familiar with has given me great pause that's all i'm saying um, i'm not making a recommendation one way or the other but i hear you that uh, um that's yeah uh, Pat? Yeah, um, in no way were you making uh, a recommendation. You were expressing an opinion. Um, and I did speak with some members of the DAB about um, the participants, um, whether they were students or not. And I'm uncomfortable um, voting for, to recommend a member who, a possible member who made a commitment and then in very, in really no way followed through on it. And I can't, I just can't do that. So it hasn't got to do specifically with her being a student, but being unable to participate after agreeing she could. Um, so. Other thoughts on uh, the motion before we move to a vote? Mandy, please. 
I, I just want to say that I disagree with um, Darcy's conclusion that the pool is not adequate. Um, right. And I just wanted to make sure my opinion on that is there, that we have one opening, we have two candidates that meet all of our selection guidance or nearly all of the selection guidance. Um, and so I couldn't agree that the pool is not sufficient. And so I dispute myself, dispute that conclusion. And seeing no hands raised, um, I'm going to move then immediately to a vote on the motion and I'm going to begin um, with Darcy. Okay. And Pat? Aye. And Mandy? Aye. And the chair is an aye, so the vote is three in favor, none opposed, one abstain, and one absent. Um, so I will pass this along to the council and our report and uh, uh, their, our recommendation to the council. Um, and I believe, well, I'll up to the, the uh, president to decide when it goes, but I think it will probably be on the next agenda. Um, since I, well, finance committee is uh, already getting started with its work. So I'm gonna stop sharing the screen um, for a moment. And um, I wanna take a look at, uh, bear with me, at our agenda. Um, so item number four is review of the Small Business Saturday Proclamation. We've reviewed this now, I think, on two other occasions. I sent a notice or a, an email to the uh, chamber and the bid asking them for uh, their advice or input, um, since I believe they are the ones who are the actual sponsors. Um, and I've not heard back. Um, this event, I believe, takes place at the end of November. So um, I felt that there is still adequate time um, if, in fact, the chamber or, and or the bid uh, wants this to be uh, brought to the council for a vote. Um, so I didn't feel comfortable, I don't feel comfortable reviewing it uh, today since I haven't heard anything from the sponsors. Um, so unless someone knows something I don't know, which is certainly possible, um, I'm going to uh, postpone this until I hear something. And if I don't hear anything, then I'm not going to put it on the agenda again. Um, so, that's where we stand with that. Um, the next item is one that is, is sort of as we come to the end of our time, um, this first inaugural council and this particular committee, um, we want to uh, give some thought to our policies and procedures and sort of get our house in order. Um, and I'm gonna need your help with that. Uh, first of all, just your input um, and maybe in some cases your help. Um, so what I had, asked you to do, or at least I had hinted at doing, was to just take a quick look at our website, um, because I think there's some documents there that, um, at least in one case, perhaps we might just rescind one and just have it replaced by a, a, a different one. Um, in other words, just some duplication, I think. Um, I think we also need to make sure that the, uh, the actual policy that we have adopted uh, is in the correct form for uh, the process for a FinCom. Um, so I don't know if anyone had a chance to look at that, but that's um, the item number five is just to take a look at our website and um, we can put that up on the screen if you like. Um, I believe I can do that. I hope I can do that. Um, and then uh, uh, related to that is, 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 is the item six, which is just the transition to the new council. And I have a document I can put on the screen for that as well, just to help with discussion. But um, while I'm looking for the website to put it up, um, thoughts people have had uh, or uh, about this transition process and about our documents and what should or should not be um, preserved. Um, there might be some things that um, we should uh, just get rid of. Um, there's some things that perhaps are duplications. And I'd like everyone to at least look over this, uh, not now, but in the next uh, few weeks, so that we are happy with what's on our website and we're happy with our, our formal documents and policies and procedures, because once we're done in December, um, a whole new group will come and take this over. Um, and we'd like to have it in a good shape. So I think it is in relatively good shape. Um, a lot of that is due to the prior chair 
and the work that was done, but um, I've tried to keep things in relatively decent shape, but we need to look at it as a committee. So I don't, did anyone have a chance to even look at um, our website? I'm gonna see if I can open it up. Um, anyone have any thoughts about? Um, yeah. Go ahead. Just, just one in general, which is we need to update which the document on recommending multiple member bodies, given that it's now a town council policy. I know Athena has put the policy into the town council policy adopted policy section that of the Town Council moved. website. Yeah. Right. Um, that, so we need to remove the, the GOL adopted one and just yeah. put it in there too. I think it probably needs to be done for CRC too, but um, okay. that's just an update of the document given what council passed a couple of weeks yeah. ago. Right, right, thank you. Anyone have a chance to look at, I'm um, just again, if I can get this to do what I wanted to do. Um, I will put it on the screen. We'll see what happens. Um, I'm not sure I can do this. Um, anyone else have a chance to look at what's up there? Any thoughts about that or uh, in general about the transition and what we need to do? Um, see what I can do here. Okay. I'm going to try and share the screen here for a moment and um, so I'm going to I have to share probably my whole screen. Uh, hang on for a second. Try this. There we go. Okay. Um, can you see the uh, website? You can. Okay. So um, what Mandy is pointing out is that this process to recommend finance committee appointments needs to be revised. Okay. And I will do that. Um, I felt, and maybe this is something people can do over the next few days, um, and when we meet again, we can talk about it. I felt there was some duplication um, between, um, uh, where is this? Yeah, this, uh, between our FAQ and our revised guidelines, which are somewhat old. And I felt that the FAQ actually is um, better. I didn't see a difference between the two and I felt one of them should be removed. Um, so that's something perhaps people need to look at and then weigh in on, um, okay? I felt the uh, resolutions, proclamations, citations, commemorations, FAQ is fine. Um, our charge is what it is. Um, meeting schedule obviously will change. Um, charge template, I don't know. We've That's something we really haven't looked at much. Um, we may just wanna glance at it and make sure we're happy with the way it looks. So I will replace this. I would like people to uh, take a moment um, at some point and compare the um, FAQ with the revised guidelines and see if you see that they both need to be there. I think one could replace the other. I prefer the FAQ, but um, okay. All right, well, somebody has thoughts about that. I'm gonna show one other document and talk a little bit about the process that we're going to uh, be engaged in for the final uh, two or three sessions that we have. Um, so let me put this away. And let me open up. Okay. All right. So um, this document is just something I put together uh, a number of weeks ago um, for myself, but I want to share it with you and see if there are things you want to add or take away, what's missing, what uh, doesn't need to be done. Um, so besides the website, which you just talked about, um, I think there's a discussion that uh, the council could benefit from uh, potentially if, we, or we're, if we're up to it um, about the whole issue of the manageability of this job. 
not GOL now, I'm talking about the council. So council meetings, time commitment, making the job manageable. Um, you may feel as committee members, it's really not our purview, um, but we are governance organization and legislation. So I would think this falls under the ca category of governance. Is there anything that, um, well, first of all, do you want to even talk about this at some future meeting? And if so, um, um, do you think it's appropriate that we might offer some advice? Would we have any advice to offer the council in terms, and we're talking about the future councils now, uh, in terms of making this job manageable? Um, so that's the first question. Um, and I'm gonna go through these and then we can go back for a moment and talk about them individually. Um, GOL policies and procedures, essentially this is the, uh, the website, at least a good portion of it is the website. Um, and uh, I think that we've discussed that a fair amount already. Chair duties, I, Mandy, you might wanna weigh in here, maybe Darcy, in terms of your experience as chairs, um, to what degree it's valuable to have an actual document that lays out what the GOL chair does. Um, would that, you know, I'm happy to sort of craft something like that and then get your input uh, uh, and before we finally do that. Is that something that you think we should leave behind? Um, a description? Is that something that, that you as CRC chair, Mandy, are thinking of doing or, are, or maybe you've already done? Um, and, I haven't drafted it yet, but yes, I was, I was going to try and leave a document. Well, many documents because of everything the chair has to do at CRC, but um, yeah. yeah, you have a particular that, yeah. that yeah. Um, detail what processes and what a chair has to do for appointment recommendations, what a chair has to do for hearings, what a chair has to do just in general to clean up and close out meetings and to call meetings and all. Yeah. I haven't drafted it yet though. Oh, okay. So you, you, your thought would be, this would be something valuable for a future, future GOL committee. Uh, the GOL chair's duties, I think, pale in comparison to some of the things that fall in the, the head of the CRC and also TSO, I think, quite frankly, um, but still. Um, Darcy? Yeah, when I started as chair of TSO, um, I, I actually, I asked you, George, and Mandy Jo for advice, and, and um, um, I got some in writing from Mandy Jo that was very valuable. Mm -hmm. That was just general, not just specific to TSO, but general chair responsibilities. So you probably still have that, I'm guessing, Mandy Jo, um, but that was extremely helpful. So having something like that, um, perhaps tailored to GOL, you think Darcy would be something we should leave behind uh, for a future GOL? Yeah, uh, or yeah, yes, probably specific to GOL and also, right. you know, a general one for chair duties generally. Okay. This committee is tasked with annual review of the rules of procedure. Um, and uh, again, that's something that could be mentioned under the chair duties, but um, it's not really clear what, you know, that's pretty much, there's no process that I'm aware of. I'm not sure that we're gonna create one or we have the bandwidth at this point to create one. I'm not sure we need one. Maybe all we need to point out is that this is something that this committee must do. And that would be under the chair duties um, and then it would be up to that particular uh, chair and that particular version of GOL to figure out how they want to do it. But they should be on notice that that's something that they are expected to do on a yearly basis. Is that required in the charter? And here I'm going to turn to Mandy. Um, where is that? Where is that in our rules? Maybe it's in the rules of procedure itself. I don't know. That seems like it would be better like once per legislative session or less even less frequently but once What's a year the, question? A lot. Uh, the annual we i believe are required to do an annual review of rules of procedure that's in the rules itself we yeah, the rules in itself the rules. Okay. or into the charge it might be in our charge okay all right we yeah. want it in either the rules or the charge itself okay, okay. we might want to amend that to be once per legislative session or something like that so um, every other two years is what you're suggesting yeah Okay, I mean, that's certainly a thought. I don't know. Um, so this is why we're doing this. So um, one item for discussion and decision would be, obviously we have to do item three. The question for us is, do we think that it should be done on a yearly basis or it should be done um, on, a, on a basis of each, you know, each council do it once for its two year 
term. So you, you review the rules of procedure at the end of your two years. Well, um, that I actually yeah. think that yeah. it would be that an annual review, if, if there aren't particular changes that come up or, or, yeah. or events that make us focus on a particular rule or procedure, that it, it's a pretty simple process. But it, having a year of experience on the council is going to open you to changes to rules and procedures. If it's, if it's every two years, you could miss really having input. Um, and I think it might be important um, okay. to keep it on a, a rotating yearly, you know, on a yearly basis. Mandy? So the other thing is that in many councils, the rules of procedures are adopted at the first council meeting of the new term right. as a complete readoption because the council is a new council and the new council can set its own rules. If you think about it at the federal government, at the state government, that's what happens. Um, and so what we could do with this is propose a recommendation for the new rules of procedure for the new council um, that they can look at and be sent prior to swearing in. And then at that first meeting, they could adopt the new rules. I know the Springfield has its own way of doing it. Um, this is our first transition where we have right. to decide whether essentially we're going to just as a council, as a whole body of a council, not readopt rules as a new adoption or adopt new rules as a new adoption. Um, what that what that process is, which which way we go. Um, in terms of it's a new council, do do they vote their new rules or do they just ignore a new vote and go forward with whatever was adopted by the prior council? And so a recommendation to this council or even to the next council on which way to go right. along with potentially, here's our experience, here's changes we'd make to the current rules if you're going to adopt new might be helpful. So you're suggesting a recommendation here one way or the other, um, okay. I like the idea of the rules as they currently stand being sent to new members of the incoming members of the council mm -hmm. so they can, can review. Um, it makes sense then that there would be, you'd have some knowledge base to make a, a vote on. So I like that idea. And you like the idea of them voting on them at the beginning. Of, so they obviously have seen them and um, then they would vote on them. Yeah. Um, I guess my concern is, and, and just it may just be the nature of things, there's nothing you can do about it, is that a group of people who've had, at least so many of them, or so, well, I don't know how many, but maybe a majority of them have had no experience with uh, the council and how it r runs. Um, sort of deciding to uh, revise their rules on the fly. Um, so th they wouldn't want to end up doing it in a meeting, probably. They would probably send it to GOL, um, but I assume they'd send it with some recommendations or thoughts. Um, I don't know. I just, <clears throat> given the, the complexity of what we do, and uh, is this where you want to start your, uh, your first uh, month in office is, um, I don't know, I'm asking, I'm thinking out loud. Mandy? So I think Springfield has, like, I think we can look towards other city councils for transition procedures. And mm -hmm. I'm not saying Springfield's is the best, but Springfield right. has essentially a retreat in December for the new council. The new council is not sworn. It doesn't matter. Um, there's no... no you know, open meeting law issues in terms of deliberations or anything. I, I think they have it as an open meeting. I'm not sure, but you mm -hmm, know, there's, mm -hmm. you know, our term ends, a new council hasn't started. We all get sworn in again. If we're continuing on, there's, there's no quorum issues or, or things. Mm -hmm. And I think at that meeting, they really discuss what changes they might want to the rules so that it's ready to go on the first night. Um, right. I'm not right. saying that's a process yeah. to adopt, but I think we should look at, especially since since we are governance, um, how to do rules 
in the transition and make a recommendation to both this current council and the fellow councilors and the do we have a transition committee? I think Lynn and Paul are dealing with transition items mm -hmm. to them about transition meetings um, and what needs to be on there for stuff. Good, I'm gonna just take some notes as we go along here. Um, what I'm hearing, whoops. <clears throat> um, What's the matter, George? No, I'm just uh, making some changes to this. Um, Bear with me. What I'm hearing here, and please speak up, is that um, the chair should reach out to the president about um, transition process. Okay. <clears throat> And the thought would be um, something along the lines of what Mandy has suggested, what they have in mind, but the rules of procedure would be about the rules of procedure and that this would be something that um, they certainly should get in advance. And if a retreat were being considered or some kind of gathering prior to swearing in, that would be a major, uh, maybe the major item of discussion amongst them. So it sounds like the chair should at least pursue that with the president. Yes. Okay, fair enough. Um, any other thoughts on that? And here, what we've suggested is that... Um, Athena might have thoughts. She raised her hand. Oh, I'm sorry, Athena. Please go ahead. Hey, thanks for letting me jump in. We have been having conversations about what needs to be transmitted to the new council and when we're looking at having a council orientation on December 13th. And part of what we would make sure that everyone has access to, in addition to the technology that people might need is um, access to the, the documents the council's adopted, the town manager's goals, the, the policies that have been adopted, including the rules. Um, so I think if, if your, your idea is for the new council to adopt the rules over again, that, that would be good to add to our, our planning for the first council meeting um, in January. Uh, but there's been, and maybe this is not a fair question for you, Athena, but at least in your uh, uh, knowledge and experience to date, there's been no discussion of any kind of retreat or any kind of gathering of the body prior to, um, this is more a matter of making sure they get information. The orientation that we're talking about in December right. on the 13th, 13th yeah. um, that would be to um, make sure everyone has access to those documents, like I said. So it would be a meeting. Um, and, then give a, would be, yeah, no, go ahead. and then give give some information about the. We did a an open meeting law and public records law and. Um, okay. And and the other thing with um, Ms. Uh, Lauren Goldberg from KP Law last time, so we're looking to see if that would be helpful. But I think any ideas that that GOL has or any counselor mm -hmm. has about what would be really helpful for the new council okay. right before they're sworn in. And then um, what they think might need to go on that first agenda in January when they're actually seated would be really helpful to, okay. to share with Lynn and me. Okay. Darcy. I guess I'm, I'm thinking that that makes sense that um, the, the, you know, I think part of what you're getting at, George, is that, um, that the council needs to look at, at, in the context of the rules, we need to look at whether we want to change some structures, um, or I should say you want to <laughs> change some structures right. Right. Um, that, um, that will help make the job manageable. And so that that is something that you'll want to do before the end of this term. Um, or, I mean, obviously the new council can do it too, but you, you might want to make recommendations before the end of this term about, um, you know, basic things about the committee structure and, you know, whether there are things that we just shouldn't do anymore because they just take up so much time, whatever. Um, yeah, yeah. And so, 
yeah, I think that's a big, big, big issue. And aside from that, um, I think that obviously, probably substantively more important to the new council group than the um, than just the rules of procedure and our processes and whatnot is the town manager goals, as as Athena said, because they're they're going to want to look at that and see if they want to tweak them, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and so that that'll be probably more. I mean, that's more substantive, obviously, for them to look at. Yeah. So um, as we go through this list, again, please correct me or speak up if you have something to add or something that doesn't look right to you. But obviously, I will update uh, this on our website. I will draft a, um, a description of the GOL chair duties um, for our next meeting. Um, I will reach out to the president and talk about the transition process and uh, discuss uh, what uh, role, if any, um, well, we talk about the, the rules of procedure, um, and uh, okay. Um, item four. This is something that, in my own mind, is is now um, pretty fuzzy. Actually, um, this process of evaluation and goal setting. Um, it doesn't seem to really lie with this committee, which is okay by me, but may not be okay with anybody else. Um, it seems to um, fall largely on the president's shoulders. Um, I'm not sure that's either good or bad. I don't know. Um, what, I guess my question, and maybe not for discussion today, but at some point from our perspective as GOL, what actually is our role um, and how should it be described? Um, do we have a role? Um, and uh, um, we did seem to play an important role in the goal setting. Um, is that something we've agreed to do that every two years? So I guess there's just some lack of clarity in my mind um, that I just would like to have it settled. And there may be documents that exist that I just need to reread and maybe then put as part of our final packet. But um, in my mind at the moment, I personally am not clear on what our actual role is and how to describe that to, to say a future GOL member. If they came up to me and said, well, I'm now chair of GOL, um, what's how does it what's this town manager evaluation and goal setting thing when, and what are we supposed to do so um, i'm going to need some advice or help here or or some guidance um, if only to documents we've already created that i've just forgotten about um, or uh, we're gonna have to create something um, or we're gonna have to say we don't have a role here it's it's really the, the function of the president is, is it in our charge i'm sorry is it in our charge good question that's something I haven't looked at in a while. So let's take a look. <sighs> okay. 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 So I will actually um, stop sharing for a moment. We'll come back to this. And let's just take a look at our charge. Oh, that's not what I do. It, it is not. Let's just take a quick look. Yeah. Okay. But annually review the town council rules of procedure is so that's yeah. where that comes in. That's where it comes from. Right. Oka had it. Oka originally had it in its charge. Um, I remember that. Yeah. So I think maybe I'm the only one, but I get the feeling I'm not that there's still some, uh, at least in uh, lack of clarity about what role, if any, GOL plays in this. Um, and uh, our charge doesn't seem to, uh, right? Yeah. So I think it's something we need to, uh, to try and clarify. And I can certainly raise that with the president as well, but I think it's also an issue for us as a committee. Um, you know, what actually is our role in this? Yeah, I think there was an order at some point, there was a, either a referral order giving us right 
I think that the, probably the goals, the goal setting was certainly referred to us and maybe also the, so it might have been referred, referred by, by council. Um, but it wasn't, you know, in the sense of, and you will, she'll do this going forward from all, all time. Um, yeah, I don't so, know. Yeah, I, it wasn't, I don't think. It wasn't. And it's not in our charge. So if it, if it was, then it should be in it. We revise our charge to put it in. Okay, so that's something that I, I it's just, I will continue to explore in the next meeting. We'll hopefully have some input. Uh, item five is the seven documents I've already mentioned. Um, and then finally, uh, this was raised near the end of our time as a JOL committee recently, the idea of perhaps training. Um, and I think there's at least one uh, new member of the council that is interested in this, and maybe we'll just leave that for the new council to uh, and the new JOL to ponder. Because um, I think at this point, I certainly don't have the bandwidth for this. Um, we could make it as, as simply in our final report, say that um, JOL might want to consider um, possible trainings. I believe this is related to bias um, was the, uh, the general thrust. Any thoughts on this? Or do you want to just leave it and it'll be up to some future body or some future council members to take it up if they wish. Well, think about it. Um, we don't need to decide this moment, but th that's my list of seven things that I could think of. Um, so, any thoughts on this? Some of this will be a future future agenda items, perhaps at the next meeting. Um, anything you would like not to be brought to us to be discussed? I'm thinking particularly of number one. I'm not sure we have any great insight into this, but it might be worth some time since we have at least four of us who've had uh, three years of experience and the challenges that the job poses and in terms of time management and, and manageability. And it's it certainly, I think, been to some a, a barrier to considering even running for this position. Um, do you want to take time to talk a little bit about it and see if we have any suggestions to make? Um, or do you think at this point, we've made all the suggestions we can make. We tried to tinker with time limits a little bit. We made little you know, changes around the edges, but nothing really substantive. And maybe there is nothing substantive we can do. Pat? I think, I don't know how to make our job more manageable, but I have been thinking off and on for a while that the council actually needs to meet three times a month, not twice a month. Um, it seems to me that uh, agendas get amazingly clogged with important materials. Um, so I, I, you know, and maybe one of those meetings could be set aside for, I'm not even sure what, but, you know, maybe it could be a regular meeting time where a certain thing happens that allows us to deal with agendas or or is more, I don't know, I, I really don't know, but I think that meeting more frequently, but then really controlling uh, meeting time could be an important thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. These are good. I mean, really? I'm just, that's what I'm really, I'm just looking for thoughts here. Yeah, that's about as good as you're going to get from me today. Well, that's pretty good. It's better than I've got. So, um... This is what I'm looking for. Um, and these would just be suggestions or things to think about. Um, we could re try to refine them or talk more about them, or we could just say, you know, we don't really have any brilliant ideas here, but here's some suggestions. Um, I think all of us are um, find five hour meetings, four and a half hour meetings, even four hour meetings to be, um, you know, we manage it, but it's quite onerous. Um, I think we often find agendas are just just absolutely packed to the gills. Um, and uh, it's not pointing the finger of blame here. It's, it seems just the way it's been. It's not like people are making stuff up for us to do. Um, but someone did ask me uh, like a month ago, you know, 
who did all this work before there was a council? <laughs> you know, I mean, I guess you could say the select board, but I don't, I didn't get the sense that the select board um, felt had quite this level of, uh, of just sheer amount of time and, and complexity of agendas. Um, and maybe it's partly about the fact that it's 13 members. That also is a, a challenge, but um, I thought it was an interesting question to which I did not have an answer, which is, you know, well, who did all this work that you guys have been doing uh, before you were in existence? Um, it's a good question. Yeah. And so how much of it is work we're making for ourselves that we, we should you know, not be doing? How much of it is a function of perhaps uh, tighter agendas or I don't know. I just don't know. Um, it does feel to me at times that our agendas are just, there's just way too much. And then sometimes some issue just people just take off, the group takes off on it and it's two hours later. And, and what can you do? I mean, it, for whatever reason, that particular topic or issue generated a huge amount of discussion and debate. And you know, what was a single item now took up two hours. Um, so there's sometimes yeah. it's just things get out of control, but any other thoughts just off the top of your heads, things that uh, could make this job more manageable, um, you know, the idea of meeting more often, uh, trying to have shorter agendas. Um, Darcy? I, I've been thinking lately that the council should, um, of the four major committees, um, that it would make sense instead of having five members to have three members and that every council person be on one committee. And so then, then you know, the, I, I feel like I'm on two committees right now. That's a lot to do. And I am not currently the chair of either one of those committees. That's an intense amount of work for somebody who might be the chair of one committee and then also have to be on another committee and do all the prep and so on. So I, you know, I've often thought that when we're in a meeting, that it could definitely be conducted with just three people, and you could get through stuff faster. Um, and then, if the president weren't on a committee and there were twelve counselors, that would mean everybody was on one committee of three people, and you know, maybe they could rotate once a year or something like that, but. I just feel like that would equalize things to some extent, and it would also, um, you know, be less work. It would be less work because all of us would only have one committee. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then maybe the recommendations wouldn't hold quite so much weight, you know, so it would be more on the full council. Um, maybe they would, I don't know. But um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just mm -hmm. feel like that would lighten the load quite a bit. Hmm. Okay. Other thoughts? How much stomach is there for doing this um, as an agenda item at our next or very soon future GOL meeting? And that's a question. I, I don't, you know. And the purpose would be to then recommend to the full council or what? Yeah, it would be part of our final report, um, you know, sort of uh, to the council and to the future council. Um, if we had suggestions, and again, maybe at this point, it's just it's just more than we can handle. But because the suggestions you made, Darcy, are interesting ones, but it, and it could take us <laughs> a number of meetings to work our way through all the implications. On the other hand, we could just lay, put them out there for the future council and future GOL to consider. Um, you know, here are some of the issues that we have uh, faced, um, and here are a couple of ideas we have about how to solve them, but um, we're not going to make any recommendations. I think probably it's unlikely we as a committee are at, this, at the point now where we can actually uh, you know, make specific recommendations, but we could offer some food for thought. Um, and yeah. obviously the committee committee would have to agree. I mean, if people are unhappy with it, then, uh, you know, or maybe it could just be couched as, you know, we've had a discussion and here are some things that various members have suggested. We're not recommending these or not, rec we're just saying, here's some things for people to think about um, as we pass our, you know, as we go on to a next or a second 
council. Um, and people can think about this over the next uh, two weeks and maybe come back with some more thoughts or ideas. Um, so my question is, do you want to pursue this or do you want to just leave it alone? We've got a couple of interesting ideas here already, but um, so that's my question. I feel like this is, is um, you know, like if every, all, the, all four of the committees do this type of thing, that that is not a good use of time because it's going to be duplicative. And why, why don't we just recommend to the president that she reach out to all of us for our ideas? If we have ones that are specific to GOL, that's different. But if they're general ideas, then it seems like we should all be sharing them in some way or another so that we can look at each other's or whatever. Well, the chair of GOL could solicit that. I mean, I do think that it is part of our function as GOL to, to raise these kinds of questions and think about them as a committee. Um, but your point is well taken that um, we should notify the president and also certainly the council that we are considering this. And if people have suggestions or ideas, they should send them to us and we can, or the chair, I guess, would put them into a final document that then would be passed on to uh, the future council um, and maybe also to the future GOL committee as well. Um, and they can do with it what they wish. I think that, that um, certainly the, the next council is gonna be looking to us for, um, first of all, they're going to expect and hopefully we'll get um, from each of the, of the four committees, um, a fairly clear sense of, of, you know, what their policies and procedures are in black and white, what the chair duties are, and so they don't reinvent the wheel. Um, they'll get a, a, a set of rules of procedure that they will have in advance to, to look at and hopefully won't tinker with too much, but that's, the, you know, ultimately it's their choice, but they're looking for that. They, they expect that that's what they're going to get. Um, do we also want to add to that some thoughts about ways to make this job more manageable is really what I'm asking us. And we could, I could reach out to all counselors and ask them to, if they have thoughts, to submit them. And then we could mull over those at a future meeting. And, uh, and then I could craft some kind of just general document on that particular question. Because um, I think that's something that that a lot of us have been thinking about, a lot of us have some ideas about, and a future council certainly might benefit from our, you know, quote unquote wisdom, or at least our ideas. But they wouldn't be specific recommendations, it wouldn't be something we vote on, it would just be, you know, here's some things that we have um, come up with or that have been suggested to us by our colleagues around this particular issue of time commitment, um, council meetings, length of, and the job making it manageable. Do you want me to send out to uh, all of our colleagues uh, a notice that we're pondering this? We're going to discuss this at our next or some very soon future meeting. I would suggest our next meeting and that if they have any thoughts, we would welcome them and I would make them available to us all in advance. Do you think that's a good idea? George, if I may. Please, Athena. I'd just like to point out that the Lynn did solicit input from the council. She sent an email back on October 15th asking for input about um, what was useful to you as a new council to start your term and so on, and, and the plan yeah. for um, the program for swearing in, the first meeting of the council and so on. So she, she has solicited input from, from all Good. counselors. Good. So that's already been done. So she did this October 13th? Oh, really? I didn't know that either. Well, some of us have been busy. Um, she sent it October 15th. She asked for feedback by the 22nd. I'm, I'm sure she would be, I want to speak for her, but I'm sure she would be willing to accept feedback after that date. Okay. So that's, again, perhaps something I should, again, I can reach out to her and see what she thinks about that. But it sounds like that she's already made this request, and so she may have some stuff already. Okay. Okay. All right, I will um, raise that with her. And for the moment, then I'm not going to put this on an agenda unless I hear otherwise from my colleagues. Um, any other thoughts or on this item? Uh, 
All right. Um, I'll stop sharing the screen. And Athena, you probably sent the minutes, but I don't have them. So um, I did not get around to them. So um, I don't have the October 20 minutes to share with you. So um, it'll be at the next meeting. I don't have anything unanticipated um, 48 hours in advance. And I, let's see who we got here in a way. If we have one attendee, oh, that's, so we do have one member of the public present. Um, if they wish to speak, uh, they simply need to raise their hand. Um, so this is the period for public comment on anything that uh, relates to GOL and our business. Seeing no hands raised. Um, discussion of future agenda items. So slightly out of order there, I apologize. We're doing nine after 10, but um, future agenda items. Mandy, um, anything that GOL might be getting in the way of um, zoning bylaws or any kinds of bylaws, please? So everything that's been referred. Um, oh, that's, CRC. that's okay. So, so that's parking access and regulation, that's mixed use buildings, that's um, the overlay parking facility overlay district. And um, that is the temporary zoning extension, which is a one word change to article 14. It, well, one number change, it changes the number 2021 to 2022. Um, CRC has added a meeting in on November 16th. Um, so hopefully we will that evening, it's an evening meeting um, starting at 7 p.m. be able to forward you a number of recommendations, at least two, if not three or four by the end of that meeting. Um, so I would request that at least they be put on the GOL's November 17th agenda. Um, as a precaution in, we won't know exactly what is recommended until the 16th at night. Um, we might have some on the 9th because we have a meeting on the 9th too. Um, most of them have been through attorney review. So I will, I'm a bit behind in that, George, I will send you emails I have from KP law on those bylaws. Yeah, because usually one of the, 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 uh, clog points, one of the, the choke yes. points is the legal review and your feeling is that, so do you have a rough idea of how many are we looking at two, three, four? Well, this is four different bylaws. Um, right. So we're looking at four bylaws that you- Four bylaws, and, yeah. parking access and regulation has right. been sent off to KP law for attorney review, even though it hasn't had a hearing at CRC yet, um, okay. or a second hearing. Um, yeah. Mixed use buildings is back. Again, none of these have had recommendations from CRC yet. We're still in the middle of that process, but right. the attorney has reviewed them. The only one that has not been sent to CRC to attorney review is the temporary zoning extension. Again, that is a one word slash number change. It is changing the year 2021 to the year 2022. Right. I wonder um, if that even needs the attorney review, I, quite frankly. I'm not sure it does. So, but but there are four zoning amendments that mm -hmm. are in CRC right now. One hearing is concluded. Three hearings are two hearings begin on the ninth. One continues to the ninth. So by the sixteenth, I'll have better idea on the ninth. But. Okay. Um, as to so, how far we can get and what is done and what is coming in on the 16th that might be there for the 17th. Um, we're obviously, because we're adding the meetings in, trying to get everything to GOL no later than the December 1st GOL meeting. But hopefully some of it can be done on the 17th, even though we might not be finished with them until the 16th in the evening. And, um... Do any of these have any, um, what, GOL reviews them and then they go to the council. Um, for the two council, meetings. Yeah, for two readings. And those are the last two meetings of the council's term. Is that correct? So the council meets on the 15th to 22nd of November and then December 6th well, and 20th. 
Yeah, I have it on the screen. I, I hope yeah. you can see it, right? So, uh, am I missing any uh, dates? I don't. I think at the not moment, not that I know of. So right. that that's why we've added a meeting in on the sixteenth to in, right. to right. try and right. be sure that all of CRC's recommendations can be done no later than your December first meeting, than the GOL okay. December first meeting. Okay. So okay, and that would still but allow for two. some of them right. can be done on the seventeenth. Okay. So for my for the rest of the committee, we do expect to see some, perhaps ultimately four zoning uh, bylaws for our review, um, either on the 17th or December 1st. I'm not aware of any other um, proclamations or resolutions. Anyone aware of anything out there that uh, might be coming so our way? Yeah. This is just a follow-up question for you, George. We finished yeah. our bylaws for future consideration review. Um, know, there were yeah. a couple in there that were recommended to be rescinded, I believe, yeah, um, right. you know, that had some action attached to them that would be bylaw action, yeah. which would again need two readings at the council because they're bylaws. Ouch. Um, yeah. So yeah. You know, yeah. what if, if you could as chair right. yes. at least notify the president which ones those are to get them on the December 6th and December 20th meetings. Yes. Okay. 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 Anything else that people are aware of that might be coming our way? Okay. All right. So we have no public comment as we've just seen, um, unless there's anything else people wanna raise, um, I'm prepared to, to adjourn this meeting at 12, 18 PM. Thank you. All right.